It's so good uh, to be with all of you tonight. It's great to be with my mom on this stage. Mom, the first time, I think this is the first time you and I, we've only been in Lubbock one other time, ever. Mm -hmm. And it was for my wedding. Mm -hmm. that, thanks, thanks for coming to my wedding here in Lubbock. <laughs> it was so fun. Hey, do it was you so remember? Fun. <laughs> Do you remember when I, when I came, so my wife grew up here in Lubbock, went to Green Line, uh, went to Friendship High School. My first time I came to visit her and her family here in Lubbock, you and Karen knew each other before mm -hmm. I was gonna visit because you had spoken at a ladies retreat mm -hmm. at Green Line before. Mm -hmm. You called Karen before <laughs> that, before I came at her. Do you remember what you called to tell her? I have no idea. You called to tell Karen, hey, I really want this to work between our two <laughs> kids. And here's what you said. Please do not eat spaghetti while he is there. I did do that. Because if I Casey that, sees yes. Josh mm -hmm. eat spaghetti, she's probably never going to want to date him again. <laughs> I didn't know this till months later that you I had done. Wait, wait, wait. I have to tell you all this. Josh, growing up, had a spaghetti shirt. He did not eat spaghetti with fork, spoon, or knife. It was crackers and a thumb. And it was the grossest thing <laughs> you've ever seen. My younger son still does not eat spaghetti. It was such a horrible, traumatic experience for him. <laughs> it, it was bad, but this is such a great honor. And hey, check it out, check it out. I've never been to OCU, but I'm rocking the socks tonight. Uh, I preach in LCU socks back in Memphis every other week. Uh, it's, part of the, it's part of the rhythm. Uh, hey, uh, man, what do you want to talk about tonight? Why don't we talk about hope, storms, is that something you'd like to talk about? Yeah, hey, so Josh introduced us earlier. Have you had any crazy introductions before in your life? I have had one. I, the last time I spoke to a group of teens was a crazy introduction <laughs> for me. I was speaking for Fellowship of Christian Athletes and uh, my oldest grandson was gonna introduce me. And I was really excited and proud to see what he was going to say. My grandchildren, my, my granddaughter, my old, I have a 21-year-old granddaughter, but this next group of grandchildren had not spoken publicly with me or anything. So Jed was going to introduce me, and he opened like this in front of all of his friends. Today we have my Grammy. She's the executive director of Wise County Christian Counseling, and she's a counselor. But my Grammy is the least athletic person I know. <laughs> And you better get really comfortable because she likes to talk a lot. So, and he heads sat up down. for you tonight. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that he was sat it. down. And the head of FCA said, that is the worst introduction I've ever heard. But as a true Grammy, I said, it was fine. Leave him alone. It was great. So, Hey, so I, I was speaking one time at uh, York College, maybe, maybe two years ago. All right, I got some York folks in the house. Uh, and this kid, this, a student, had just come to know the Lord. Like he had just developed a prayer life in, in, in his life. And he was asked to pray for the speaker. So this guy gets up, had never led a public prayer. He had just started praying privately. And he got up and it was, it was beautiful. I mean, just, you know, God, thank you. And, and a few things he said, and he's like, God, be with our speaker tonight. John Ross. Oh, wait, God, that's not it. That's um, <laughs> James. No, I don't think that's it either. And he was like so committed in prayer. <laughs> he just kept going through names. And finally, it was like, God, just please be with the preacher from Memphis. Amen. And that, that's, how it, that's how it went. All right. So uh, we, we do want to talk about just uh, storm tonight and encounters with God. Because part of what we want to do tonight is try to prepare you in life. Storms are going to come. And a lot of times in life, you're not going to go looking for storms. Storms are going to come, come find you. I don't know any eight-year-old or any 10-year-old who sits there saying, you know what, I really hope the day comes where I'm addicted to porn. I hope the day comes mm -hmm. when my parents divorce. Or I hope the day comes when, and just, I mean, just name it. Like, we, there's so many things in life we hope, like, like they just, they come and they, it's like they find us. So part of what we want to do is try to prepare you for when storms of life come, that there's a foundation that is there. And then there's also some just pastoral care we want to give to you because we fully acknowledge that there are storms that have already come in many of your lives. And we hope to have a word of God for you. I know the last year and a half for a lot of us, not for all of us, but for a lot of us, I mean, it has been a wild year and a half. The weekend before COVID shut most things down across the United States, David Fraser and I were traveling out to Washington, D.C. to speak at a discipleship event. And I was on a plane from Memphis going out to D.C., 
And this, this kid, I say kid, he's probably 18 years old, freshman in college. And he came and he sat right down next to me. There were only two seats on this row. It was me and this kid was next to me. And the kid, I could tell he had never been on a plane before because he could not figure out how to put his seatbelt on the plane. So he was just like clashing it, thinking it was like, like it would just stick together somehow. So I walked him through how to put it on. I asked him, he was on some mentorship program for spring break. So first time he and a bunch of his buddies had ever flown before. And he's next to the window. And the moment we took off, he was so giddy. Like he's elbowing me like, uh, dude, you can see people in their backyard. And he's like, you can see cars. And, and just these little things. He was so giddy. And then he did this right here. He leaned back and he went, Whoa, oh, oh no, oh, whoa. Now, if you know anything about me, throw up is like one of my greatest phobias in all of life, all right? I, I, I'm not one of these people that throw up. If you throw up, I just will, I will despise you for the rest of your life if you throw up around me. I'm better since I'm a dad, but it is a phobia. And this guy, he's like, oh no, I'm getting kind of dizzy. So I handed him the bag and I, and I sat there and he's like trying to, like his, his, his head spinning. I was like, dude, you look at me right now. And I like patted his knee. I just patted him. I was like, look at me. And I'm not exaggerating the story at all. I was like, look at me. And he looked over at me. I was like, you're gonna do what I do right now. And I leaned back and I said, I'm going to breathe and you're going to breathe after me. And I took in a deep breath and he sat there with me, taking in deep breaths and breathing out. And we went through this breathing a little bit. And I know, mom, I know you do this with a lot of people in your therapy all the time. You've got to learn to breathe, like just settle down and breathe. And the rest of the flight, he was fine. And David Fraze and I were getting off an airplane to speak at a discipleship event called Breathe. And little did I know how many times in the coming weeks God was going to be patting me saying, will you just breathe? Like, take a breath. There's so much going on in your life and you're so distracted right now. I just need you to breathe. And I hope that part of what Encounter is doing for you this week is just helping you just sit back with God a little bit and breathe. In 2018, my family, my wife, my two boys, we traveled down to Florida. And here's how it happened. I had a friend who had a condo and they said, hey, no one's using our condo. Do you want it? And anytime somebody offers you a free condo and it's seven hours away, you go. So we went down there. My wife loves the beach, loves it. All right. She didn't grow up going to the beach. She, went, she was more of a mountain person growing up, loves the beach. She wants seven days with no excursions, get out at the beach at eight o'clock and she will stay there until eight o'clock. Like that is her idea of vacation. She loves the beach. On the way down there, we are getting notes on social media as, we're, as she's scrolling and we have people texting us saying, hey, I know you're going to Florida, but there's a tropical storm that is coming. And that tropical storm was heading straight for us. We had one day at the beach before we had to leave. One day. And we watched this tropical storm coming from the window. We got in our car and we left. That's how quick it was. Now, while we were in this condo, up on the 15th floor, as I'm overlooking, seeing a tropical storm in the distance, I knew that was a day that my mom was expecting a phone call. She had been to the doctor. She had had some tests run. And I knew, I knew that day the doctor was calling you. So I called you. I remember where I was standing in that condo. I called you. You picked up the phone. And that was the first time I heard you say, Josh, you won't believe this. I have cancer. You want to pick it up from there? I will. I will. That was um, really a Holy Spirit moment that Josh called me. I hadn't even told my husband yet, but I, uh, my head was reeling with it. Now, in hindsight, in 2018, September of 2018, I'm going to tell you, they found a really, really tiny tumor I had a really, really tiny surgery and I did really, really tiny treatment. My doctor said, best case scenario. If you're gonna have cancer, this is the kind to have, great. That's also in hindsight, two and a half years later, because when it's your name mentioned with a word like that in the same sentence, nothing feels tiny. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nothing feels tiny. And so I, uh, begin to wrestle in my mind, what is this gonna look like? What am I gonna do? Another opportunity to live out my faith. Another opportunity to make a decision. How am I gonna live out my faith? Am I really gonna be committed to what I said I believe in? Am I really gonna work on trusting God? I'd already had another storm experience that taught me, be very careful when you say, I'm trusting the Lord. We do not, listen to me very clearly here, we do not trust the Lord that we're gonna get our way. 
We're going to trust him that he's going to show up in the storm. And so while they were in Florida, Josh and Casey let the boys call me. My, my grandsons call me. And they're sitting on the couch, and I remember their innocent faces and me going, how am I going to speak life into these boys when my own head is reeling? And Noah, the youngest one, raised his hand. And I said, Noah, did you have something you wanted to say to me? And he said, I have a question. I said, what's your question? Noah said, are you going to die? And I said, you know what, buddy? I am going to die, but probably not from this. I don't think I'm going to die from, from this. We got this. We're, we're going to take care of this. And then on the way home, I think it was, you called. Do you want to take for that or you want me to tell it? Uh, I think it was the next day I called yes. because I kind of had this idea in me for a while. I, I've, I've written a little bit of my life and I, I, my mom has um, been doing a lot of women events and speaking events and grief work and she's been running her own counseling center out uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth now for about 15 years and a grief center now for 10 years since my sister tragically died, her oldest child, back in 2010. So I knew there was a lot inside of her, so much wisdom. So I called her the next day and I was like, all right, mom, I've had this idea, but now I think we need to write a book together. Are you in? Uh, and I know, I think I said, D don't you need to pray about this yes, a little you bit? Did. You suggested that to I do me. That. And before we got off the phone, you're like, I'm in, let's do it. <laughs> all right. And that started a process of us writing a book. And we're not going to talk a lot about a book today. It's called Scarred Hope. We're not going to talk about it. You want to talk about it? No, I just wanted to Get show it. Get on Amazon. It. Oh, you want to show, show it? it? Yeah. You have to see it, the book because it's so pretty. Take a peek. <laughs> Beautiful it was fun. book. All right, and. <laughs> So the, the introduction, I kind of tell the story about this tropical storm in 2018, the call I made to my mom, finding out she had cancer, and then I, the, I end the introduction, the very last line is, and I am so glad to tell you that my mom, that we have now published this book with my mom as a cancer-free woman, hmm. which was awesome. <clears throat> yeah. So that was... 2019 when the book came out. All right, so check this out. 2018, I went to a condo, tropical storm. 2020, last September, it was my 40th birthday, which mom, I have to be honest, when you and dad were 40, I thought you were ancient. Like, I, know. I thought y'all were so old. Like I was telling my friends, like I don't think I'm gonna have parents much longer. Like these, <laughs> these people are old. I don't feel that old at 40. I don't know if my kids think I'm old or not, all right? But to celebrate the 40th anniversary, the same friend said, hey, you know what? Y'all need the condo. So we went back down to the condo. So we get to the condo. This is last September. I mean, 2020, everybody needed some kind of vacation, right? So we went, to, we went to Florida. The first day, if you show this picture on the screen, first day, look at the weather. The sun is out. Casey doesn't know I'm showing this picture. I think she would be okay. She has taken a three-hour nap out there on the balcony of the 15th floor, just soaking it up. All right, and then we get more messages from friends saying, you won't believe it, a tropical storm is heading your way. This tropical storm, now, <clears throat> this is where I still get angry when I talk about this, all right? <clears throat> this tropical storm turned into a hurricane, Hurricane Sally. If any of you are named Sally, I don't ever want to meet you, all right? Um, <laughs> I just want you to notice Hurricane Sally was heading to Louisiana, <clears throat> all right? Louisiana, New Orleans. New Orleans is, there, everybody there, they're like, get out of New Orleans. This is September of 2020. It is heading to New Orleans. So we're thinking, we're good. We're going to be right here. And next thing we know, the next day, go to this next image. Look, what, watch what happens. What? <clears throat> how, does, how does a storm turn 90 degrees? Like a Lubbock driver seeing Brahms, right? Like, whoop, whoop, here we go. It's all of a sudden that happened. Now, here's the thing. Where we were down in Florida, we're on the, like this little peninsula, and there was a bridge that connected us to the mainland. And this time, we're like, man, if this is a tropical storm, it's not coming for us. We're staying here. We are not leaving. And my wife's like, I'm going to have more than one beach day. I am not leaving. Uh, and then we found out, okay, this is a hurricane. So now it's like, we need to make a decision. But they closed the bridge 24 hours before before the storm came. So before we made a decision to leave, we, we knew that we're here. Like we're about to go through a hurricane, Hurricane Sally. 
I was calling up every prayer list I know. Like, you got to pray for us. Now, something you need to know about my wife and I, just our personalities. I don't know if you do Enneagram stuff. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I'm all up for adventure. I love risks. I love taking plunges. I love just jumping into adventures in life. My wife is a six on the Enneagram, which means my wife is a worst case scenario thinker. All right. Uh, she's also deeply loyal. Now, as a seven, there are times I look at my wife and I'm like, baby, faith means you go to the edge and you jump. And Casey's like, no, faith means God has given you a brain and you need to think through options. Like, this, is, this is how we get think through things in our marriage. So, I mean, 10, 10 years ago, I was like, baby, we need to move into an under-resourced community and we need to raise our kids among the poor, which we ended up doing. But it's my wife who's like, can we just think through some scenarios here? But once we move into a neighborhood, there's nobody who's a better neighbor than my wife, than Casey. She knows everyone. She pastors everyone. That's just who he is. So when it came to like the Grand Canyon, I'm like on the edge I'm like kids y'all come here and Casey's like 20 feet away like I'm, I'm good way back here when it came to the hurricane I was like baby we can do this and she's like what if we don't make it I'm like well what if we do make it and we have stories to tell <laughs> and somewhere Casey wrote a little letter and left it there in a drawer just in case we didn't make it it was like our final wishes <laughs> that night we we made it through a hurricane to a category two hurricane now, here's a video because at one point in the night, our phones were blowing up saying, there, there's a tornado. This is Casey in the bathroom. This is my six. This is my son, whose personality has a little bit of both of us. And, and here's my oldest son. Watch this. <laughs> Not a care in the world. He woke up the next day and was like, hey, how was the hurricane? Like, he slept through the whole thing. There were nights the condo was doing this, all right? He slept through the whole thing. The next day, we find out we got to leave, all right? Casey, she cries. She only had one and a half beach days, all right? I'm in that condo, standing in the spot that two years earlier in 2018, I called my mom and found out she had cancer. I'm standing in that spot. And my mom calls me again. And what did you tell me? I have cancer again. And right there, you would think, Josh Ross, don't you ever go to that condo again. <laughs> ever. It, it, it was wild, that same exact spot. Mm -hmm. This time the doctor was using words like, your cancer's crazy. It is so weird. We don't know what's going on. They think it was from a needle biopsy that it left cells behind. It was craziness. This time there were lots of tiny tumors. I had a huge su surgery and I'm doing lots of treatments. I don't have hair as fine. Well. Oh, I have a little bit of hair. You can see it blowing in the wind just a little bit now. It's coming back, but I've done ke chemo. I'm doing radiation right now. I had a treatment this morning. I'll be back in the Metroplex tomorrow afternoon to do another treatment. But it got really scary for a while till, till we knew what was gonna happen. I didn't know, I just had my gallbladder removed and I was convinced. My mind ran away with me. I was convinced I had cancer all over my body before I did a body scan. I was convinced it was everywhere. I began to envision my life without me in it. I began to envision my chair on Christmas morning and there wasn't anyone in my chair, but my whole family was around having a great time and I was so glad that they were. It got time to eat Christmas lunch and my chair was empty and they had done takeout food in, in my thoughts. I began to wrestle with, what's it gonna be like to die? What's it gonna feel like? About that time, Terry Rush's wife died. Terry Rush is a very, a wonderful minister from T Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Terry said his wife said this right before she died. You know, I thought it was gonna be harder than this. This isn't that hard. And I thought, Lord, even if I die, I want to walk this out with faith, but I don't know exactly what that's gonna look like because I'm so full of fear. I'm so full of fear. I was working with a psychologist at that point. I was working with him as the counselor. We were doing it as friends, no paper exchange, no money exchange. I was just helping him as his wife had just died. 
But then all of a sudden, he turned it on me. And he said, what, what are you afraid of? He helped me face my biggest fear. And you know what my, my biggest fear was about dying? My pictures are all in boxes and my girls won't know what to do with my pictures. They're just in boxes. He said, well then do your pictures. And I said, I will, I'll get my pictures done. It's what we spend our life doing is figuring out how are we going to live? And how are you gonna live until the last breath is taken? We sang songs about it earlier. We sang songs about the commitment there. Now, right now, I'm pressing hard into a verse in Re Revelation as I'm telling you this. Revelation, it's either 12, 11 or 11, 12. I love the verse. I'm just not, it's one of those. And it says this, we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. And so what I want to do tonight is to share a little bit of my testimony. You're one of the first groups to hear it. I've been too sick to speak. I want to share a little bit about my testimony, but I'm not sharing my testimony for if you get cancer. I'm sharing my testimony for when you go through a fearful time. You see, it does not have to be like events for us. But what we walk together with is events that lead us in like emotion. Fear is really real. We've got to figure out how are we going to walk out when we feel afraid? What are we going to do with fear? This man that I was talking about, the psychologist, gave me some verses. But the one he gave me that I loved the most, listen to this, it's out of the message and it says this. It's in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. I read this verse every hour, on the hour, for weeks on end, in the middle of the night. So we are not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Your story may not be cancer. Your story may be being bullied or being a bully. Your story may be your parents getting a divorce or maybe you're afraid they're going to. Your, your story may be a diagnosis, yours or someone else's that you love. It may be that the last year has created a lot of anxiety for you. I don't know that I've ever heard the phrase, I don't know, more than I've heard in the last year and a half. When's this thing gonna be over? I don't know. How long do we have to wear masks? I don't know. Is someone that I love going to get COVID? I don't know. Is someone that I love going to die from? I, I don't know. What about prom? I don't know. What well, are we gonna have sports? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. One time years ago, I went through a season in my life that I was doing a lot of I don't knows and I cried out to the Lord. Really in trouble, I was eating lunch with another counselor and she began to ask me lots of questions. My husband is a minister and he had just been fired. He had not done anything wrong. It was just this church routinely fired people every two years and it was just our turn. It crushed us because we really thought, here we are to save the day. We really thought we were gonna help this church, but it didn't work out like that. So I'm eating lunch with the counselor and she begins to shoot questions at me. Where are you gonna live? I don't know. Well, where are you gonna work? I don't know. Is Rick gonna stay in ministry? I don't know. Now, there's two words I do not want used with my name in the same sentence. I don't want you to say these words about me. I don't want you to believe that I'm a pessimist and I don't want you to ever say I'm boring. I don't want to be boring. And so I started changing up. I thought, I'm doing boring answers here. So I started changing up. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I just don't know. I mean, just emphasize different words if you're just gonna say the same thing over and over again. But I felt in this restaurant, I felt my throat begin to clamp. And some of you know that feeling because you're about to throw a really big fit. You can feel it in your throat first. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. I stood up, I told my friend, I said, I'll call you later. And I went to the car and I cried out to the Lord, God, I don't, I've just been over an hour coming face to face with the things I don't know. And the Lord did speak into me. Some people asked me, was it a male voice? It was not, but it was a settling in my soul that I know the Lord spoke into me. And he said this, my daughter, you are a baptized believer. 
this is what you know. You know that no matter what happens to you, I will always be God. And you know that you're coming to see my face. And you know that you will have a close circle of family and friends who will journey beside you until, until you see me. And that is all you know. And I kept repeating that even in the cancer journey. This is what I know. So we are inviting you into our story tonight. What is the storm that you're dealing with or have dealt with or see on the horizon? Sometimes the storms don't even have to be real like me. I began to envision my life was gone and it wasn't. What are we going to do with that? What's that going to look like? What's that going to sound like? I want, I want to really be clear. I'm a woman of deep faith. But I was incredibly afraid. And I want to come back to that in just a minute. So, <clears throat> I know you still have 29 radiation treatments in front of you. I do. Another big surgery here in a few months but you are sitting on that stool in front of Encounter as a cancer-free woman. Yes. And yes. 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 And I could not be more proud of the courage that you have embodied, you have witnessed to everyone. You now have clients who had treated you for the last few months. Mm. So thank you for modeling bravery for us. You, you sent in just a few pictures, if we can show these. I, I was able to travel in for a few of my mom's chemo treatments. And this is, my mom was trying out new hats because she knew she was going bald. And then this next picture right here, this was, mom, this was your final chemo treatment. And they, they let me back because they weren't letting a lot of people back there. This was the final chemo treatment, last day. I remember I, I was kneeling there next to you before I took this picture. And I asked you, I said, mom, I got a question for you. What was harder, raising me or going through chemo? And you did not answer that question, Mom. <laughs> you, don't, you never answered the question. If you, one more picture. Uh, this is my mom with me and my brother. Uh, and she had a whole crowd uh, around her celebrating her. And some of those people who have been some of your greatest support system are here uh, in this place tonight. So uh, thank you for, for sharing. How many of you would say over the last year and a half it has felt like you've been in a storm? It's not everybody, but some of you. All right, good. At least you're... you're you have maybe a story or a memory that you connect to. What I want you to know in life is no matter what storms you go through, Jesus went through storms too. Meta metaphorical storms, Jesus also went through physical storms. The first one you read about in Jesus' life is in Matthew chapter 8. And it's a, it's a fairly short story. And I just want to read a couple of verses. But it says this, that Jesus got into a boat. And his disciples followed him and suddenly a furious storm came upon the lake so that the wave swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. And, it, and if you don't mind, just keep that up there real quick. If you don't mind putting that verse back up there. Suddenly a furious storm came upon the lake. The waves were, they swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Is there anything that strikes you, mom, about that? Just those two verses? I think what stands out to me is his, his per personhood, his humanity. Jesus had just worked really hard all day healing people. And for Jesus to be asleep and not notice the storm, I mean, you know that those boys were not quiet while the storm was going on. There was some hooping and hollering going on on that boat. You know it. Jesus was sound asleep. The peace that he had. So it was humanity and sacred. Yeah. I mean, two things, two things that strike me. One, well, after seeing my son sleep through a hurricane, I'm like, that's how Jesus did it, all right? That's, what he, that's how he did it. Uh, but two things. One, <clears throat> have you ever been through a storm in your life and you felt like God was just either sleeping or not near? Mm -hmm. And the disciples, I mean, they're freaking out about the storm, but they're also like, how, how can you be sleeping while we're about to die? Mm -hmm. And there are times we go th through things in life and it's like, God, I, I know I've been taught in church and I've been taught at camps and my youth ministers taught me that God is near and God is present and God is closer than our own skin. But there are just times it feels like either Jesus is sleeping or Jesus isn't nearby. Mm -hmm. And then there's just the, the, the ability Jesus had to embody peace no matter where Jesus was. It's something God wants for us to be able to breathe and to center our hearts no matter what kind of chaos is surrounding us. And then there's a longer story and I just want to read it. 
And this may be something you talk about here in a, a small group time. But in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22, it says this. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Which I always kind of chuckle because this is right after the apostles. This is right after they ate all the, uh, all the bread and all the fish. So imagine people who were stuffed with bread and fish. And now it says Jesus made them get into a boat. <laughs> and I wonder how many of them were like, Jesus, we don't do boats. And Jesus is like, get in the boat. And they're like, I, I, we just ate. Like, we're full. Like, you get motion sickness, right? <laughs> yes. Easily, right? Yes, easily. Like, some Dramamine needs to go with that bread and the fish before you get on the boat. He yes. made them get in the boat. And then it says this. After he had dismissed the crowd, Jesus went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. So, the, the apostles are out on a boat in the water. Jesus is up on a mountain praying. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. All right, and they, and they were just full of fear. Verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. So however you visualize this storm, this story happening, somehow, I don't know the distance between where they are and where Jesus was walking on the water, but for them to have a conversation with a storm that is happening out on the water, you have to think they're, some, they're somewhat close to be able to hear each other. And they're like, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. And they say, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come on. And you don't see it in your Bible, but P Peter says, I was just joking. I really didn't mean it. Like, <laughs> I wasn't just joking. I didn't really mean like to come out to you. And Jesus like, come on to me. All right, Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, which I love that image. It's, a, it's an image I often pray over people. Like I want Jesus to catch people when they fall. This isn't just Peter who's like sinking and Jesus lifts him out of the water. Jesus catches him while he falls and says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. I want you, I, here's what I want you to be able to visualize tonight is that Jesus didn't catch Peter and then calm the storm so that they could walk over clear water to get into the boat. Jesus caught Peter and it's not until they're in the boat that the storm ceases. And I wonder the power of that moment, like what it did for Peter for the rest of his life to know that there is one who caught me before and walked over and through the storms of life to get to a place of safety. And sometimes Jesus does the same thing with us. We serve the one who is victorious over any storm we may face in life. And the one who wants to help us walk over and through that storm too. And when they get into the boat, worship breaks out. Which in the Gospel of Matthew, in the life of Jesus, in Matthew, Jesus is worshiped as a baby and he's worshiped after the resurrection. But in the life of Jesus, this is the only time where there is a full-blown worship service where the worship is directed at Jesus as God. They worship. Some of the best worship services you may ever take, a, take part in in your life is after the storms of life. My wife talks about after the bus wreck in 1999 at Green Lawn, some of the worship experiences she had after that, that just called her and invited her into the presence of God. So here's what my mom and I wanna do for just the next few minutes. We wanna walk through six principles, maybe 10 minutes if we can do this. If you go longer, I'll go shorter, all right? Six I'll principles. And in your small group time, I want, you just to, I want you to be thinking and we're gonna do six principles for you. I want you just to latch on to one. What is one of these six that you can hold on to in your life? And this is going to be a question in some of your small group's time. Uh, the question will just be, of those six principles Josh and Beverly talked about, which one resonated with you? And Mom, you go first. Okay. All right. The first one I want to talk about is God is present, whether you feel him or you don't. So many times we talk about, and it's so great when we feel the presence of the Lord, but I've been in churches before that sometimes it's the preacher, sometimes it's the worship minister, sometimes it's the youth minister that says, come on people, don't you just feel the presence of the Lord today? And I've been sitting in the audience going, no, not so much, don't feel him today. But you know what? The presence of the Lord does not hinge on if I feel him. 
I have to know he's present, whether I feel him or I don't. The number one command in in the Bible is don't be afraid. I'm with you. Now, frequently we emphasize the don't be afraid. And so we've taught Christians not to talk about their fear, but that's not helpful. What's helpful is we recognize I don't want to stay in my fear. I want to recognize the Lord is with me. Don't be afraid because he's with me. The presence of the Lord, that part of the verse needs to be louder in our hearts than the don't be afraid part. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. I want to be really clear right here and tell you, bravery is not bravery. Courage is not courage if there's not a fear involved. If I do hard things that don't scare me, that did not require my bravery. That did not require my courage. Bravery and courage are required when we do things that scare us. We have to know our fear so we know what to do. I am scared when I have to do new treatments I haven't done before. It's scary to me to know how my body's going to respond. But I know the Lord is with me. We've got to be able to hold space with that. We've got to be able to know what is it? But the Lord is present. The Lord is present. The Lord is in the place. So when the storms of life come, I want you to think about this second principle. Live from a place of victory. Live from a place of victory. Storms last just a moment. Like a hurricane comes through, it doesn't last very long. A tornado comes through a town, it doesn't last very long. Thunderstorms come through, they don't last very long. But the consequences can last a long time. The damage that can be done in a very short amount of time. And this is so true for you too. Let your moral compass be off for just a few days. And there can be a lifetime of consequences. This is just how it works. Now, as much as we wish that in our baptisms... Or at encounter, like God could hold up that men in black thing. If you've seen the movie Men in Black. And do the little flashy thing. And then all those bad things from your past are just gone. And they're not there. It's not the way it works, right? That God's not going to erase every event from your past. But God can redeem every event that we go through in life. Mm -hmm. God can redeem it. And there's so many times I preach in front of Sycamore View. Where I preach in Memphis on Sundays. Where I see heads that are down. And I know some of the things that people have been through in their life. And I know that they believe they've been forgiven. But shame, the enemy is just holding shame over their head. I coach my sport, my boys in a lot of their sports. I've I've just finished coaching my my oldest son, his uh, baseball season. And one thing we do as a team is when somebody makes a mistake and their head is down, everyone on the team reminds that kid to get their head up. And I'll be honest, there are times I want to look at that kid and be like, dude, you suck. Like you really do. Like... (laughs) Like, your head should be down. Like, your parents should never pay $200 for you to play baseball again. Like, this is not for you. You're bad. Your head should be down. But that's not, that's not what we do. What we do as a team, we're like, heads up. Head up. And even this weekend encounter, even tonight as we're talking, as I'm thinking, as I'm praying, I'm like, God, for the people in this room who are going through life and their head is down, their eyes are closed. And I know that's a posture sometimes we pray in, but because things in your life are so heavy or your past is weighing on you so much, remember, live from a place of victory. Go ahead. Okay, the third one is this. There is no storm. Remember that list I did a minute ago and you may have a different one. There is no storm that can rob you of God's peace, of his joy, or of his hope. I heard, uh, not shortly, uh, pretty soon after my, my daughter died, I was in Memphis with Josh and Casey, and I went to a Bible study with Casey and heard a beautiful young woman quote John 10.10 in a way that absolutely made it come to life for me. John 10.10 says this, The thief has come. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. This is Jesus speaking. But I've come that you may have life in abundance. That you may have life in abundance. What does that mean? This beautiful woman was in her early 40s, single, and never had a child. And those were her life dreams because she wanted to have a child. She wanted to get married. But she'd broken up with a man young when she was early 20s because he walked away from Jesus. And she knew the Lord would give her another man and he didn't. 
she had what we would call an unrequited dream, a dream that did not come true. The thief came to steal from her, to kill her joy. But Jesus came that she would have life in abundance. And that night it was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. The thief came in my life and he tried to kill all my peace and all my joy and all my hope. But Jesus came that even as a grieving, broken-hearted mother, I could still have life in abundance. Even with cancer treatments now. I don't have cancer right now, but cancer treatments. I can still have life in abundance. His peace is still mine. His joy is still mine. His hope is still mine. His peace is still yours. See, what Satan loves to do is mess with people your age. If he can get you off your peace game and joy game and hope game young, then maybe you won't ever figure out you can have it. But we've got to stay focused on what Jesus wants to give you most. It matters how you walk out your faith. It matters tonight as a teenager, as a teen, as a youth leader. It matters how we walk out our faith with peace, with joy, and with hope. The fourth one is this. Uh, Storms will scar you, but they do not have to define you. So a few years ago, I had a woman named Danielle. She called me in the, at the church office. And Danielle had uh, a woman with a low self-esteem, had been battling depression in her life. And her coping mechanism was liquor, drugs, and sex. And no matter how much she went to liquor, cocaine, and sex, it would only temporarily fill her heart. And then she would find herself in this place again, low self-esteem, depression. So one day she decided to end it all. So she was taking some really strong mental health pills. She was supposed to take one a day. And this one particular day, she took 43 of them in the same day. She doesn't remember what happened next. She ended up in the ER where for days they both saved her life, brought her back to life, kept her alive, and they admitted her into a mental health uh, place there in Memphis. And that is where God began speaking to her through dreams encountering her heart, trying to open her up that there is a better way. So she called me to come and they allowed me, uh, they allowed me into this institute to meet with her. We began studying the Bible together, looking at Jesus. She was released from that place. We continued looking at Jesus. And then one Sunday morning, we stepped into the waters of baptism in front of our church. And as we stood there, I said, Danielle, before I baptize you, I want you just to hold your arms up in front of the church. And she held her arms up. And from her, el- her, her wrist to her elbow on both arms, she, she had been a cutter mm-hmm. for years. I mean, she would just cut herself. And these weren't fresh wounds. These were scars that had been there for a long time. And I said, Danielle, something right now I want the church to understand is the same thing I want you to understand that in this moment, you're going to go under this water where you're going to die with Christ and you're going to raise up a new person. This is a gift of God for you. But those scars that are on your arms will be there for the rest of your life. And the enemy wants to use those to like take you back to your past, that place of a low self-esteem and depression. God wants to use those to remind you of God's faithfulness through the storms of life that you have been through. To let you know that your past does not have a hold on you. Not when Jesus is involved. Right, that Jesus sets us free. So the scars may be there through the storms, but these are stories of redemption that we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. That's so powerful, thank you so much. Do things that nurture a no matter what kind of faith. And that phrase was, uh, came alive for us at Jenny's death, at my daughter's death. We stood around Jenny's bed. We told her goodbye in several, several times the day that that she died, several different movements. But um, the next to the last time that we were in her room before they took the, the machines off. I do not remember doing this, but the nurses said, do you remember praying? And I said, I don't. There were 11 of us in the room and our charge nurse, her name was Shiny. She said, you did. And I said, what did I pray? And she said, you said, God, we're so confused. We don't know how to walk this out. We don't know our lives without Jenny and we don't wanna know our lives without Jenny. But God, may we develop a no matter what kind of faith 
and may we make a decision that we will not walk away from faith because of this moment. Then Shiny said, you opened your eyes and you ran around to every person and you made them promise to you that they would not walk away from faith because of Jenny's death. She said, you even made me promise that I would not walk away from faith because of Jenny's death. Now, what are things that develop in no matter what kind of faith? I believe that they are to develop a prayer life, to learn how to pray, to learn about scripture, to have index cards. I mean, I put together a little book of my verses, of some of my verses, but I carried around index cards forever with me. Just kept them in my purse, index cards of verses that I would have known in an event like this. An event like this, there'll be something said in an event like this, and we pray it's something tonight that was said that will help you develop a no matter what kind of faith. Just a phrase, a thought, a song. What a gift. Friends, a support system, older adults that speak life. May you make a decision while you are at encounter. God, I will never walk away from you, no matter what storm comes my way. I will choose to follow you forever and live into that promise. Yeah, so God is present whether you feel him or not. Live from a place of victory. There's no storm that can rob you of God's peace, joy, and hope. Storms will scar you, but they do not have to define you. Do things in nurture and no matter what kind of faith. And the sixth thing is this. Encounters with God are meant to be shared with the world. Encounters with God are for you to transform your life forever. But at some point, encounters with God are meant to be shared with the world. In Matthew 14, the encounter with God, with Jesus, when Jesus calmed the storm, it ended up being this worship service. Some of the best worship services we may have is when we've been through the storms. So mom, here's, let's close this way. Okay. And why don't you stand up, if you don't mind. Mm -mm. And we want to pray over uh, just a couple of different things. And just want to bless you, pray for you, give you some things to reflect on. Leading up to a moment where we're going to sing songs and you're, you're going to be invited here in just a moment to respond. For some of you, it may be a response to reach for Jesus, to be baptized into Christ. For some of you, it may be just naming a storm in your life that you just have to get it out there. But, but one thing we want to do first is this. What we want you to hear tonight, one thing we want you to hear tonight, is that if you wait until the storms of life come, and then try to develop your foundation. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's hard. That's right. When thunderstorms come through, wherever, whatever town or city you live in, you're not thinking, you know what we want to do right now? We should go build a shed in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, you don't build things outside when the storms are coming through. We want you to take seriously your foundation now. So that when the storms of life come, you're standing strong. And for some of you, honest with yourself, you're living on a faulty foundation. Mm. You're living on something that's not going to sustain you. So if you will, just close your eyes, bow your heads. And I just want you to receive, just for a moment, just truth of God, a blessing of God. Lord, I pray this night that every person in this room knows how loved they are by you. Oh God, just give us a glimpse of it. Just a glimpse of how loved we are by you. May we open our hands to your peace and help us to breathe that in of your joy and of your hope. Hope. The living hope as we sang about our living hope, Jesus. May we know in this room that our lives matter, that it matters how we walk out our faith, that it matters what we say, what we do about you. God, may we not get tricked, lied to, that to build a foundation is complicated or hard. God, you made it so simple. We just have to repeat simple over and over and over and over again, and we choose to do that. I ask that you give us willing hearts this night, open hearts this night, to lean hard into you, to prepare in the light for what we will do when darkness comes. One Amen. thing my mom and I did not want to do tonight was to try to force you to think about a storm that has happened in your life over the last year, year and a half. Some of you have been doing fine over the last year. 
But, but right now, I want to ask if you can identify with things we have said tonight, and you know in the last year of your life, there has been a storm that you have faced, and it has shaken you to the core. Will you just stand where you are? I'm not going to ask anything else of you, but if you'll just stand right there where you are. <clears throat> and just your standing is a moment of confession, a moment of reaching for God. And for those standing, I want to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads, and uh, I just I invite you to open your hands where you are for no other reason. Sometimes it helps me. My heart sometimes follows where my posture takes it, and sometimes it's just opening my hands that opens my heart to receive from God. I just want you to know tonight, there's nothing you've gone through or that you're going through right now that God's not aware of, and that God's not, he's not going to leave you alone. I want to ask you tonight in courage to reach for God. And for those in this room who are too weak to reach for God, know that God is reaching for you. That's right. You were created and made in the image of God. Mm. You were a child of God. And there's no storm that God doesn't want to conquer in your life, no storm that God can't walk through. So God, in this place, we surrender these things to you. My prayer, God, for my friends standing up right now is that you will give them an overwhelming sense of your abiding presence with them. And I pray victory and strength. Mm -hmm. God, I pray uh, miracles, testimonies that they will come from this place and from this week. We hold them up right now, God, in the power of the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. We're going to sing a song, and I invite you to come uh, to the front. There'll be leaders to receive you. This can be a place of release for you. May God have his way in this time.